Good morning. Today we will be talking about DC motors and uh, since this is a large chapter we will spend also next week with this topic. Uh, DC motors are one of the motor types that we will discuss. Uh, we will start with DC motors because they will allow us to understand quite easily the principles for all other motor types. Uh, although today DC motors are not the most common type. The most common type is the induction motor today and we will spend about four lectures with the induction motor. Uh, today we will discuss mainly the construction of uh, a DC motor and uh, then some basic properties that we can expect from it. Uh, so let's start first with the construction of the DC motor. Uh, on this figure you see the main parts of uh, a DC motor. Uh, of course it is the shaft, but the shaft is not import important from the principal point of view. Uh, then uh, we have uh, the stator magnets. Uh, what you see here in, in this picture is the case of a permanent magnet DC motor. So uh, there are two types. One is with permanent magnets, one will be with field windings. Uh, smaller motors, up to a few kilowatts roughly, are uh, designed usually with uh, permanent magnets. So smaller motors have permanent magnets. Uh, larger motors, they have field windings. Uh, the goal of the permanent magnet or of the field winding is to create a magnetic field here uh, that will create the torque. Uh, the second component is the rotor coil and this is a major difference if you compare a DC motor and uh, for example a permanent magnet synchronous motor uh, and induction motor. For a DC motor the coils are on the rotor. So uh, you need some way to transfer the current to the rotor. Uh, and for a DC motor, all the current is going through the rotor. So you need uh, typically a very large current pa to pass through the rotating part. Uh, if this is, for example, a synchronous motor, which we will discuss at the very end of this class, this, this course, uh, you will see that there are also rotor coils sometimes, but uh, the current is creating the magnetic field and is a lot smaller than for a DC motor. So that's one of the construction properties of the DC motor that uh, you need to transfer from the stator into the rotor and back a significant current. Uh, the current into the rotor coils is transferred with the commutator and with brushes. Uh, we'll see in a, a few minutes how those parts look like. Uh, the commutator and the brushes are the major component for a DC motor and they also are causing uh, the majority of the problems that we have with DC motors such as uh, electromagnetic interference, uh, they, can, they can cause uh, tr mechanical trouble if they need maintenance and, and so on. It's not that bad, but it's one of the biggest disadvantages of the DC motor. Now let's, let's take a look now uh, in a more detail on the parts of a DC motor. So we have a rotor and we have a stator. As I said, the stator is the part that is creating the magnetic field. So uh, on the stator we may either have permanent magnets or we may have field windings. You can see the example of field windings here on this picture. Uh, you may have different number of field windings in the stator. In this case, you see four. So we have one, two, three, four field windings and they are used to create a magnetic field. The construction of the stator for a DC motor is 
completely different compared to an induction motor or uh, to a synchronous motor. The main goal of the field winding is to create the, the magnetic flux. So we want to create a magnetic flux. If this is created with two coils, it will be uh, a uniform distribution uh, of the magnetic field. If it's four uh, field coils, we will have some other magnetic field shape, as we will see a little bit later. Uh, the materials in the stator need to be ferromagnetic. So the stator is created from iron. And uh, since we are having a DC magnetic flux, the stator does not need to be laminated. So in the case of a DC motor, the stator can be solid iron. The rotor, on the other hand, uh, is rotating, so it sees uh, a variable magnetic flux, and uh, it will need to be laminated. So we will see that uh, the stator is not laminated, rotor is laminated. I have here some example that I will show you later uh, how the rotor looks like. Now, it's not very visible, unfortunately, here in this picture, but let me just to turn off the light for shortly, and well, doesn't help at all. Uh, what we should have seen here is the coils in the, in the rotor. Maybe I go to this, to this picture. Uh, those are detailed pictures of the rotor, and you see that we have the rotor coils placed uh, in uh, an iron packet. What you see here are individual sections of the coil, so the coil can be, for example, like this, or it can be over more, more slots. And uh, hopefully you can also see that this is not a solid iron, but that it's laminated. I have here some examples of rotors. So uh, a rotor for DC motor can look like this. Uh, you can see that here we have the stator uh, rotor iron. We have individual coils that in this case are stretching over about five, five slots. And there are more sections that we have in the, uh, in the ro rotor. Uh, the part that you see here is the commutator. And all the coils are connected to the commutator. Uh, you can see the commutator also here. So we have multiple sections of the coils and uh, they are all connected here. Uh, the commutator serves as a mechanical rectifier. As we will see, it will switch between individual coils, and the current that will flow in the rotor will always flow through at least one coil on the rotor. The contact between the commutator and the stator is made by brushes. The brushes, mm, we'll see also a little bit later, uh, are typically made from carbon and uh, they are spring-loaded. So it means that there is a spring that is pushing the, the brushes against the commutator so that we have a good contact. I have here a different, well, larger types of DC motors. So uh, the structure is exactly the same. Uh, you see the iron here, the coils in the slots, and then the commutator here, and the brushes would touch the commutator uh, so that we have the current. You can see on those pictures that uh, we can have also the version where here on the shaft we have some screw for, for motion, like a ball screw, for example. So uh, DC motors, one of their use is uh, in servos where we can use them to move something. It can move, uh, it can move something up and down, it can rotate something, and we can have a feedback connection. Uh, if you look on this picture, on some pictures you see the rotor, the slots of the rotor are straight, and in some sections they are tilted. Uh, the reason for this tilt is that if you tilt 
the slot, you are basically moving the wire in the coil, and uh, this will give you a more uniform torque distribution per one revolution. We will see a little bit later the calculation for a DC motor, and uh, you will see that the torque of the motor depends on current, uh, magnetic flux, and uh, if we would use only a single coil, then uh, we would have a pulsating torque. So that's the reason why we have multiple coils, and we can further improve this by this tilt. If you tilt that by some defined angle, you will be having a more uniform torque around the, the, the rev one revolution. <coughs> and now let's take a look on the laminations. Uh, as I said, the rotor is laminated. The rotor is also called armature. So in some cases I will call this rotor, in some cases I will call it armature. That's the same for the motor. And uh, you see here the armature laminations. So it's exactly the same steel as we have seen for uh, the transformers, for example. It is also electrical steel uh, with a high content of silicon. There may be a difference. Uh, we basically have two types of electrical steel. One is grain-oriented and one is non-oriented. For transformers, at least for some of them, we can use the oriented steel, which has better electrical and magnetic properties. For DC motors, uh, we need to use non-oriented steel because the magnetic flux is changing direction. So it would not make any sense to use grain-oriented steel because this would mean that in different directions we have different behavior. Uh, I have here some <laughs> examples of this steel. So uh, those, this is electrical steel for rotors. You see we have thin slots here and inside of those slots uh, we well, this is for an induction motor, but for the DC motor, it looks in a similar way. The difference is that here we have winding, we have coil, and for the induction motor, we just may have some bars, uh, and we typically do not have any coils, although we also may have coils. But the function here is different. Uh, for a DC motor, the coils on the rotor are used to create magnetic flux, and they are creating the torque. In the case of the induction motor, uh, it's also working like a coil, but we do not power it uh, directly. We power it through induction from the stator. Uh, something more about the commutator. So the commutator has uh, more sections. Uh, the more sections you have, the smoother the torque of the DC machine is. Uh, but on the other hand, you cannot make a very large number of sections because uh, you are limited in the diameter and uh, you are also limited in the size of the brushes. So uh, here you see a typical commutator. It's a copper ring and this copper ring is divided with those slots into individual sections. The sections are insulated and uh, into each section from this side, you connect the coil on the rotor. And then on this side, there are at least two brushes that connect this arrangement to the stator. Uh, I have here some example of uh, a DC motor, including a gearbox. So uh, this is the rotor. You see we have bearings. Here on, the on this side we have the commutator and then the shaft is connected to a gearbox. Uh, that in this case it's a planetary gearbox and this reduces the RPM. So this could be like a mechanism to control something like a telescope or a watch or some, something that requires small RPM. Uh, the reason why we are working with high RPM motors is that this gives us higher power density. So it means that the motor 
can achieve relatively high power and it will remain small. So if you want uh, a motor that will directly drive with some lo low RPM, it will be very big because uh, torque is uh, proportional, or size of the motor is proportional to torque. So if you build a, a high speed motor, you have high power, but you have low torque and the motor is small at the end. That's the reason why you find many gearboxes in motors that are directly embedded, for example. Uh, let's take a more detailed look on the construction of the stator. Uh, here you see an example of a stator with four field windings. So here we have one, two, three and four field windings and you see uh, that here those poles are not laminated because it is DC magnetic flux. So it can be solid iron. So now how does it, how does it work? Uh, the field winding on the stator creates a magnetic flux. So here is an example of uh, a magnetic flux in a DC motor with four field windings. So here you see we have the four coils, one, two, three, and four. They are creating magnetic flux if we provide them by current. Uh, the magnetic circuit is closed, that's very important. So what you see here in red is the direction of the magnetic field lines. And uh, if the magnetic flux is closed, uh, we will have a significantly larger torque in the machine. So here we have the poles. So we have four poles on the stator. We have four field windings. And then with this, uh, with this uh, frame, the magnetic flux is closed. So for example, if the current is oriented so that we here we have a north pole and south pole, the magnetic flux closes like this, like this, like this, and like this. So uh, in this part, we will place the rotor. And in all other pictures that I will show you, I will of course assume that the magnetic circuit is closed. I will not plot it because the pictures would be too complicated, but be sure that it's always closed. If you build a DC motor with an open, or any, any motor with an open magnetic circuit, it will work, but it will have very low torque. So, how does it work? This is the principle of um, a DC motor. And the principle is very simple. We have a wire, we have a current that flows in this wire, and we place this wire inside a magnetic field. Uh, from physics, you know that uh, if we have a wire with current in a magnetic field, there will be a force acting on this wire. So it will try to move the wire away. So this is what happens. Here we have the current. This is a magnetic field, so here it's shown as two permanent magnets, but uh, the magnetic circuit needs to be closed. So there needs to be a frame that is closing the magnetic, magnetic flux. So we have uh, a field strength B between those magnets. Let's say it's oriented in this way. And the current here is oriented in this way. So in this case, there will be the force that will act from bottom to top in this arrangement. And the size of the force can be calculated by this formula. So uh, it depends on the magnetic field strength. So the larger here we have the magnetic inductance, then the larger will be the torque. Uh, it's a vector multiplication, so the direction of the force is perpendicular to the field that it created. And uh, it depends on the current, so the larger the current, the larger the torque. And it depends on the length of the wire in the magnetic field. So if you make a longer motor, uh, it will have larger torque because the force will be larger. 
On the other hand, if you make a larger rotor, a uh, longer rotor, uh, you may have problems in mechanics. So you may have a long shaft, you may have problems with, uh, with, with uh, frequencies and uh, with weight and so on. So what you see here in this picture is this part. We are creating force that is facing up. The current in the coil on the rotor forms a loop. And then on the second side of the coil, we also have a force. So the force in this case, since the current is going in the opposite direction, will be created and will force will face down. So here we have one force up and one force down times the rotor di diameter or uh, yeah, the rotor diameter that is known will create the torque that we require. Uh, so this is in the initial position. Let's say the coil is perfectly aligned with the magnetic field. Now if we rotate this a little bit, then we will see that this force will split into two components. One component will still be facing up, but one will be facing in the other direction. What you see here is the commutator. So we have two sections on the commutator right now. And here we have brushes. So the current from the power supply is passing into the brush through the commutator, through the winding, back into the commutator, the second section, through to the brush, and back to the power supply. So this force now starts moving the rotor. So if I have, for example, this position, now the rotor has rotated by some angle, and we see that we still have the wire in the magnetic field, so there is still some component of the force that's facing up and down, of course. But now this force is having a component that is perpendicular to the direction of the current. So this component is F times cosinus theta, and theta is the angle of rotation. So uh, we still have some force, but now the force that is creating the torque is smaller. So uh, we had the maximum torque in this position, but here this the torque that was available in the motor has decreased. If I rotate the coil in this position, then the coil is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and the force that is creating the current is zero. So if we do not count with inertia in this case, then the motor would stop in this position and would not move uh, back or would not move further. So this is the reason why uh, we need multiple sections in the commutator, because we need multiple coils. Also know that in my simplified example here, in this position, here the commutator is shorted with the brushes. So now we do not have any current that will flow through this coil, and that's the second reason why the force is zero. So in a real motor, we definitely need more sections on the commutator, and uh, we will short circuit only the closest coils, since here in this position, uh, it, it's short connection, uh, if this short connection, there will be a large current. So that's not very good. And the size of the brushes needs to match also the size of the sections on the commutator. Uh, however, if you have inertia, then this position will be overcome by the inertial forces. And then you have this position, approximately. So in this position, you see that this section now connected to this brush. In this position, we had this section connected to the left brush. And now this section is connected to the right brush. It means that the current direction in the coil has reversed. 
because we have changed the polarity between the brushes and between the commutator sections. So now I have changed the direction of the current. So this means that uh, I have again torque and now I have torque that is acting in the correct direction. If I would not switch the polarity here, I would have a torque that is going backwards and forward and it would not rotate. So in this case, we have changed the direction. We have again some force and we are able to create some torque. So this happens over and over in a DC motor. Um, at the end, the construction of the DC motor can look like this, for example. Um, we, so we see again all the major components. The shaft, bearings of course, uh, from electrical point of view, the stator is very important. The stator is creating the magnetic flux. Here we see the rotor or the armature, as it's called, with the coils. The coils are connected to this winding, uh, to, to this commutator, and then we have brushes that connect the current out. I have here some examples of uh, the several DC motors. So uh, DC motors are on, or were used in applications where you require easy control of speed. As we will see a little bit later, uh, DC motors can be controlled very easily because you can control the speed by controlling the magnetic flux that you have in the state. This is a small current, so you do not have to control the large current that is going by the, in the rotor. So if you need an application that requires variable speed, then a DC motor is a good option. On the other hand, uh, you need to maintain the commutator, uh, you need to exchange the brushes from time to time. I say, I say from time to time, for example, in uh, electric uh, trains, you some, some maintenance books say that uh, if a train uses a DC motor, then you need to exchange it like every 100,000 kilometers, roughly. So it's not that bad. Uh, some more examples. Uh, so here you see another DC motor, uh, something a little bit smaller, like 500 horsepower uh, DC motor and how they wind the armature. Um, later we'll take a look on, on a video uh, how this is done. So DC motors are available for large and small powers. So now we'll discuss a little bit more in detail what is happening in a DC motor. Something very important is called armature reaction. An armature reaction is uh, the interaction between the magnetic field of the stator and magnetic field of the rotor. Imagine the following situation. Here we have the magnetic field of the stator when we do not have any current in the rotor. So for example, here you see we have the poles. Of course, the magnetic flux is closed, so there would be a frame that will close the magnetic circuit. That's not that important right now. But uh, the construction is done in such a way that here we have a uniform distribution of the magnetic field lines. On the right picture, you see the magnetic field created by the rotor, just by the rotor itself. So if it would be separated completely from the stator. So the coils in the rotor are perpendicular to the plane of the picture. So they are creating magnetic field that has roughly this shape. But in a real motor, there will be an interaction magnetic field. So if you add this to and this, you will get 
a distorted magnetic field, which you see here on this picture. And this is what's called armature reaction. It will have an effect on uh, the adjustment of the motor, and uh, it will have also an effect on the construction, because we want to eliminate the armature reaction. Uh, the armature reaction has uh, the effect that if you have the axis that you, that you see here of the magnetic field, in this case it's vertical, but if I add the rotor and stator magnetic field, the axis of the my magnetic field will be inclined. And this inclination will have an effect that uh, during the switching of coils in the commutator, we are not switching zero voltage. And if I'm not switching zero voltage, I will have some sparks on the brushes. So the effect of this is that we will need to incline the brushes according to this angle caused by the armature reaction. And by inclining this, we can eliminate uh, the sparking on the rotor. It's not that easy because the direction of this angle will depend also if your machine is working as a motor or as a generator. So uh, if it's a generator, then you will have a different direction of the magnetic field and the angle will be going in the opposite direction. So if your motor is switching between motor and generator mode, uh, you cannot completely eliminate this effect. A second effect of the armature reaction is that we will have a distorted stator magnetic field. What you see here is a uniform distribution. So if I would plot this uh, in a chart, you, you would see that nothing here, then some magnetic field and nothing here again. But if I plot this, plot this here, we will see that there will be a smaller magnetic field here because the two magnetic fields interact. And there will be a different magnetic field here as well. So if we look on the distribution of the magnetic field under the poles, you will see the following result. What you see here is uh, if you take the rotor and stretch it in, in a line. So here is the stator that's stretched. You see this is an example of two poles. And here we have the pole one and two, and here we have the winding. So without armature reaction and in an ideal magnetic circuit without any leakage fluxes, there would be nothing here. And, th and then we would see an increase of magnetic induction and then it would, would decrease and then here it would be negative. Now if we count for the armature reaction, we will need to sum those two fields together and you will see something like this. There is some increase of uh, the magnetic field. Then we want that here we have uh, a flat magnetic induction because magnetic induction gives us the torque. So if it's flat, it means that the torque is not changing at in one revolution. Then it's going down. We need to change the polarity of the magnetic field and then we have a flat section again. So this repeats over and over. If you see here, the brushes are placed in the position where we have zero magnetic flux. And the reason is simple. If you have zero magnetic flux, then if the rotor is aligned in exactly this position, it means that you have zero induced voltage, and this will produce you zero sparking. But if now you add here, you see this picture is the sum of uh, the rotor and stator magnetic field, you see it will be different. Here we have uh, this is the sum, and now this plus uh, the flux from the rotor has created this shape. So we see that it's shifted in one direction, in my case to the right, uh, here you see that the zero magnetic flux is not in this position, 
where it initially was. So I need to shift the brushes to this point. This is called the neutral axis. So you need to mechanically move the brushes so that you align it correctly. And this will produce no sparking. And what you see here, is here and here are, is the effect of saturation. Saturation means that uh, the magnetic flux is limited and cannot be stronger than something. And this is limited by the material properties. So if you use a different material, you may have a larger saturation, but uh, we are limited to something, but let's say, like 1 or 1.5 Tesla of the saturation for normal materials. How to work with that? Well, uh, we need to mm, set the position of the brushes in such a way that we neutralize this effect. So one possibility is uh, to mechanically move the brushes, as you see here on this picture. So the brushes can be moved so that they are aligned with the position of, of zero magnetic flux. But as I said, if you would reverse the function to, into a generator, this would shift in the opposite direction. So that's not very convenient because you would need something that detects if it's a generator or if it's a motor and moves mechanically the brushes. Uh, what you can do further is uh, you can connect an additional winding uh, in series to the main pole and this winding will compensate this automatically. So uh, that's what you see here on this picture. We have the main pole that is creating the magnetic flux. We have the armature, and here you have uh, additional poles, and those poles are connected in series to the main pole. So there is the same current that is passing through this main pole. It's perpendicular, so we will have an interaction of the magnetic field from the main pole and from the compensating pole, and uh, if, even if I reverse the direction, we can have uh, this automatically compensated. So if you know that your motor, uh, or if your machine will work as a motor only, you can set it manually. If it should work in both quadrants, you should use this, or you should buy a motor that has this arrangement. So now we'll take a look on uh, the properties of a DC motor related to power and efficiency. So on the input of a DC motor, you have some current. This current is providing uh, the magnetic field in the stator, but also, and that's the m major part, a current in the, in the armature. So on the input, you have uh, the input power that you take from the power supply. And since it's a DC circuit, it's simple calculation, it's voltage times current. So on the input, you have uh, the input power. Uh, then you have uh, the losses in the windings on the rotor and on the st in the stator as well. Uh, this is known as jowl losses. And jowl losses are proportional to the square of current. So if you know the rotor winding and stator winding resistance, uh, you may simply calculate the jowl losses that you have. But this is only one section of the loss, total losses. So the input power minus jowl losses will give you what power do you have in the air gap. And through the air gap, through this magnetic field, you are transferring all the power to the rotor. So what you see here is the power that is in the air gap. That's basically giving you the torque and speed of the motor. And then you have the core losses. The core losses here are, they mean the losses in the magnetic circuit. So this will include uh, hysteresis and eddy current losses. Uh, 
We will have mechanical losses, losses in the bearing. We will have uh, ventilation losses, air friction, and so forth. And uh, with the term that we call stray losses, uh, we express all the losses that we cannot account for, usually. It could, it could be related to windage losses, how fast is it, is it moving, and so on. So it's not possible to easily calculate it. So this is usually expressed as stray losses. Few percent is lost. We know where, but uh, it's not as easy to calculate it. And on the output, we have the torque and speed. So this is the output power of uh, the on the shaft of the motor. Uh, the efficiency of uh, DC motor is not bad, but uh, it's not as good as induction motors and not as good as uh, permanent magnet synchronous motors. You have losses on the commutator, you have losses on the brushes, uh, so the efficiency can be high, uh, but it's lower than transformers. Transformers, let's say, have 95. This may have like 92, 90 percent. Uh, it again depends on the, the size of the motor. If you have a larger motor, it will have larger efficiency than a smaller motor. So now, how can we connect the DC motor. I said that we have basically two windings. We have a winding on the rotor and we have a winding on the stator. So we have two coils and we will have basically two ways how this can be connected. So if you look on the DC motor, you will see that we have a field winding and we have the rotor winding. And in this case, uh, we can power it independently. So it means we have one power supply for the field winding and one power supply for the rotor winding. The field winding is typically powered with a small current, let's say a few amperes. The stator winding or rotor winding, armature winding, is powered typically with a larger current. The current depends on torque, as we will see later in the equations. Uh, so if you look on a terminal of this kind of DC motor, you will see four terminals. Now we'll have different ways how we can interconnect those four terminals together. So we can power the armature winding and the field winding from separate power supplies. This is what you see in picture A. So here, the field winding is creating the magnetic flux. We have it powered from a different power supply. The second, this is the armature winding, is also powered from a separate power supply. We will see later the effect of this, uh, but this can be very easily to control because the torque will depend on the magnetic field strength. So if you control this, you are controlling a small current and uh, it's quite easy to do it. We'll see, I think ne maybe next week, what effect this will have on mechanical properties. Uh, the second option is that we create this connection. We create a serial motor. A serial motor means that uh, the field winding is connected in series with the armature winding. This means that the current that flows in both windings is the same. This motor needs a different construction, typically, because the field winding needs to be designed for the same current as the armature winding. On the other hand, we will see that this serial motor will have very good mechanical properties, especially if it is used as a traction motor. So, for example, if you want to drive a train, then the serial motor has a very good characteristic mechanically because it will have large torque for low speed. So when you 
need to get it moving, you need large torque. And when you have high speed, you need low torque. And this is exactly what can be achieved with a serial motor. But on the other hand, you need to pass a very large current through both windings. And very large current will depend large losses uh, because uh, Joule losses are proportional to the square of current. Uh, the second or third possibility is this. We have uh, the armature winding and the field winding connected in parallel. So what you see here, we have uh, the current going through the armature winding. Then here we have the field winding. In this call case, it's called the shunt field because it's in parallel. And here we have a rail star that will control the current. So now we just need a one power supply. We are taking the power for this field winding directly from this arrangement. We will have losses on the rail start because we will need to control the current. It, this, this and this is approximately the same in terms of mechanical characteristic. There will be a huge difference between the serial and this arrangement, the parallel, but uh, this is roughly the same. And the last type D is called compound and it combines both. So you have uh, a serial field winding and then you have uh, another field winding that is connected in parallel. So you may partly change the magnetic flux by changing the current with this rheostat. So this will allow you to change the mechanical characteristic and uh, you will have still the ability to have a large torque initially for low speed, which is good for driving something. Uh, on the other hand, if you need a DC motor that is easily controlled uh, and that does not change that much the speed with load that you apply, it is this arrangement that you should choose. So here I will probably plot it We'll discuss it in more detail next week, but uh, the serial motor has uh, this type of characteristic. This is speed. Well, let's say this is, no, this is torque, and this is speed, and it has this type of characteristic. So for low speed, I have high torque. Uh, but this arrangement, what you see here, is completely different, and if I am applying the torque, the speed is dropping only slightly. So this is good for electric vehicles, for example, because you can start moving with a large torque, and when you are moving with higher speed, you don't need that torque. Uh, this is good, for example, for electric machines that where you need to control precisely the speed, and you want to maintain it constant. I have some video that I will show you next week that demonstrates the applications of, of this. Any questions so far? Okay, so now we'll take a look in the mathematics that describes the DC motor. Uh, we will work with equivalent circuit diagrams. Again, the equivalent circuit diagrams as for a transformer they describe us with electrical symbols what is happening in the motor, but it's not a mechanical equivalent. So it does not mean that if you connect uh, inductors and resistors in, in this way, that it will be a DC motor. Definitely not. It's only uh, some tool that will help us to understand the functionality. So in a DC motor, we have two windings. One is the field winding, and one is the armature winding. We can represent the field winding by a simple RL circuit. So a resistor and inductor connected in series. So this is what you see here. We have the field winding here, and I have represented that with an inductor that I call LB, and a resistor that I call 
RB. So now from circuit analysis, we can write an equation for this circuit. Since now we will be working in transient states, all our equations will be differential equations. We cannot m use the DC or AC circuit analysis here because it's not in steady state. So we can sum the voltages. The voltage on the resistor plus the voltage on the inductor has to be equal to this voltage VB, which is the power supply voltage for the field winding. And then we have this equation. So inductance LB times ch change of current, that's the voltage on the inductor, plus RB, IB, and this equals to the power supply voltage. So we have one differential equation that describes the field winding. Now the field winding is creating us a magnetic flux, phi, and this magnetic flux is what is creating the torque in the motor. The armature winding will be also represented by an inductor and a resistor. So here we have the armature inductance and armature reactance, uh, so resistance. We do not count here the brushes or the commutator. We hide everything here in this resistor and in this inductor. We will again write the equation for this circuit. So now we have the voltage on the inductor plus the voltage on the resistor plus we have something that's called induced voltage or back EMF. Induced voltage is created when you have a wire that is moving in a magnetic field. So here this induced voltage will be a function of speed. In order to inco inco incorporate that, uh, for now, I will just say, okay, it's some voltage, but later we will see that it's a function of speed. So there is a relation also with the mechanics. So at the end, we will have electric equations describing the electric circuit, and we will have also mechanical equations for the motor. And this is the equation. You see here the armature winding. This is the voltage on the inductor plus the voltage on the resistor. And this is the induced voltage. And the sum, in all cases, needs to be equal to the power supply voltage. So now, why we needed differential equations? The reason is that all this is function of time. And we also need to account for effects that are happening in the magnetic circuit. When we have discussed magnetic circuits, I showed you the hysteresis curve. And I told you that uh, there is a linear section and that there is a, a nonlinear section. If you are operating in an electric motor, you are trying to make use of the magnetic circuit and this use needs to be as good as possible. So you cannot work just in the linear region. So if you look on the hysteresis curve, here this is the linear region, but you will work somewhere around here. So we will have a non-linear dependence between magnetic flux and between the field winding <laughs> current. So this will be expressed by this formula. It's generally a nonlinear function. And let's say uh, that we can express that with some constant times the current IB. This obviously works only in this linear section. It does not work in the nonlinear area. So now we have a relation between current IB and between the magnetic flux. So this will connect us the magnetic flux from the field winding with the magnetic flux on the armature. Now the second thing that we need to, do, need to do is to define the induced voltage. I've said that the induced voltage is proportional to speed. So that's what you see here. 
omega is the angular speed, but the induced voltage is also proportional to the magnetic flux. If you have a wire, you move it, the wire in a magnetic field, you measure the induced voltage, you will see that the induced voltage depends on speed, but it also depends on the strength of the magnetic field. So if you make a stronger magnetic field, you will have uh, a larger induced voltage. So this is here expressed by the magnetic flux. And of course, the induced voltage will depend on construction. How is the motor made? What air gap size do I have? What materials are in and so forth? So this is all expressed by this constant, uh, which you can get from the manufacturer, for example. So there is a direct relation between induced voltage, speed and flux. And now we can combine these e equations with the mechanical equations. Uh, the torque that is created in the electric motor, in the DC motor, is a function of current, it's a function of magnetic flux, and it's a function of construction. So this is again expressed by this electrical torque equation. So here this is the armature current, again magnetic flux, and the same constant described in the construction. So this is the electrical torque that is being created in the motor. And if you look on the mechanics, you will find out that the input into the mechanics is the electrical torque. Then this is the load. So this is what torque you are taking away from the shaft. This is friction, for example, friction in the bearings and this is the moment of inertia. So this is a third differential equation that will describe the behavior of the motor. So now if we combine all those equations together, we will have a set of a few equations describing completely the DC motor. So again, we have an equation for the armature. Now note that I have already substituted here this part Initially it was the induced voltage, but now it's uh, speed times magnetic flux times constant. The torque is proportional to current and flux. For the field winding, we have still the same equation. And then we have the mechanical equation that is describing us how this is moving. And we may have also some equation for the magnetic circuit. Now note that uh, this is all for a DC motor with field windings. If this would be a permanent magnet motor, then the magnetic flux is created by the permanent magnet. So we don't have this equation and we don't have this equation, but we have a constant magnetic flux. So we will just have this equation for the armature, for the torque and of course the mechanical equation. All this is describing the DC motor in transient. So it's valid also when you are changing speed, when you are changing load, when you are changing currents. Uh, you see that those are three differential equations. If you look on the solution of it, uh, you will find out that those electrical equations are typically significantly faster than the mechanics. So we apply current and the current will immediately create magnetic flux. But uh, it will take some time before the speed is changing, simply because here you have some moment of inertia and this is large. So in an electric motor, although we may use those equations, uh, we typically remove this influence of the rate of change of current and we are sticking just with this mechanical equation and the other equations are simplified. So we say that the, the electrical circuit is much faster than the mechanics and therefore we neglect the electrical behavior. So what we do is that we say okay 
and we will have this zero. And then you have this equation. And this equation relates you the speed of the motor to the current, to armature resistance and to magnetic flux. So this is one very important equation. It will allow you to calculate the speed of a DC motor. So we see that the speed for DC motor depends on the power supply voltage. If I use a larger power supply voltage, we will have a larger speed. Here we have armature resistance and it's power supply voltage minus the voltage on the armature resistance. And uh, by changing the armature resistance, you can change the speed as well. So you are in fact able to connect a resistor in series to this, uh, to this armature and you can increase it and this will decrease your speed. You can also change current if you want to change speed, but this has a drawback. As you see from this equation, the torque is function of current. So if you change current, you are changing torque as well. So if you want to control independently speed and torque, you cannot change current because there is a link between those two. And you can also change the speed by changing the term here in the nominator. And uh, you can change it by magnetic flux. So if you have a DC motor with field winding, you can quite easily change the magnetic flux. And this will change your speed. But of course, it will change your torque as well. Because again, torque is related with flux. So those two equations are quite important and you will need them definitely for calculation in the exam, for example. Now, if we look on the torque speed characteristics, which are quite important for um, designing any devices with motors, uh, we will have basically two types. One type will be called separately excited motor. That's the one where you have a separate power supply for the field winding and another power supply for the armature. We will neglect the transients. So we will neglect the friction and we will neglect the moment of inertia. If you do that, you will see that the torque that you create is a function of current <coughs> and that the speed is also a function of current, function of voltage and function of flux. But the flux here for a separately excited motor is created independently on the current because it's powered with a different power supply. So if you plot the torque speed characteristic for a different kind of motor, for, for this kind of motor, you will see it's looking like this. It's linear. Well, linear because this is a linear equation. This is a constant and I have some constant minus some variable. So this is a linear equation. And uh, what you see here, the, those two curves are for two different armature resistances. So uh, if I add the, the names here, uh, this will be for, let's call that RA. 1 and this will be for RA2 and in this case RA2 is larger than RA1. So if I have a larger armature resistance, the speed will drop faster. In other words, if this is for example an electric drill, with, if it would have a DC motor, then initially I have some torque and as I load it, the speed is decreasing. If I have a different armature resistance, it's decreasing more with the load. So now how can we control the speed of this DC motor? If you look on this equation, the speed control will be very easy. Uh, 
because the speed control can either vary the power supply voltage, VA, or it can vary the armature resistance, or it can vary the armature current, or it can vary the magnetic flux. So we have four ways how we can control the speed for this kind of DC motor. But if I change magnetic flux, I'm changing torque. If I change the armature current, I'm changing torque as well. If I change the armature resistance, I'm increasing losses, because Jow losses on a resistor are R times I squared. So it's possible to add a resistor, but this will increase the losses and this will decrease the efficiency. So the only option that I have if I want to create low losses is that I will vary the input voltage. And the most common way today is uh, to use pulse width modulation, PWM. It's using a transistor as a switch. And uh, it's taking the advantage of the fact that I can change the power supply voltage, the mean value of the power supply voltage, and uh, I will still have high efficiency because I will have only losses on the transistor, which are quite small compared to losses on the resistor. So how does it work? Uh, this is the schematic. So here you have motor. We have uh, the transistor. And uh, let's start with the, f the, the time when this is completely on. If it's completely on, it means there is current flowing. The motor turns with some speed. But if I switch the transistor with a rectangular signal, something like this, I turn it on, I turn it off. This number is called a duty cycle. So with duty cycle 0 0.5, the motor is on for half of the time and off for the half of the time. The current in the circuit cannot change instantaneously because uh, it's an RL circuit. And in an RL circuit, the current cannot change abruptly. So uh, we will look on the current and we will see something like this. This is time. This is current and voltage. So my voltage is like this. Those rectangular pulses. And the current will be exponential sections. So when it's on, it will increase exponentially. When it's off, it will decrease exponentially, like this. So by changing the weight of the pulses, I'm able to increase or decrease the current. So by varying the duty cycle, I'm changing the mean value of current, which is this, and I'm also changing the mean value of the voltage. And if you look on the differential equation uh, for the electric circuit, which you see, which you see over here, uh, this has the effect that we are changing basically this power supply voltage. So the advantage of this PWM speed control is that we have low losses because the only losses are here on the transistor and we do not add any resistors. So this is what's, con what's uh, used today in all uh, variable speed drives with DC motors. Uh, for example, in Prague, some of the metro lines are using these DC motors. Some uh, other metro lines are using induction motors with frequency inverters, which we will discuss in, in a few weeks. Uh, anyway, does this frequency is typically in the audible band. So let's say like 5 to 10 kilohertz, and you can hear it. So that's, that's this sound when the train or tram starts moving, if it's using DC motors. The effect for induction motors is exactly the same. And the reason why it's uh, in the audible band is that we are trying to limit the losses on the transistors 
so that here we are able to cool the transistor down. And uh, switching losses for transistor, they depend on the frequency. So if you double the frequency, you basically double the losses on the transistor. So it, it's technically possible to place it in the above the audible band, but uh, it would require cooling and uh, it would have lower efficiency than it is today. Uh, here you see we have a diode. This diode is called a free wheeling diode and uh, it serves to protect the transistor against overvoltage and also to conduct current uh, in the time when this transistor is off. If you see here, this is the voltage that you have on the transistor. If I turn it off, the current needs to flow somewhere. And in this moment, the current is flowing through this freewheeling diode. And if, if it's the case, then if you measure the voltage on the transistor, you will see no spikes at this moment and at this moment. If you would have uh, not the freewheeling diode, the voltage that here is on the drain of the transistor will be typically very large and will destroy the transistor. It's like three, four, five times the, the power supply voltage normally. So this is also a connection for switching inductive floats. So it does not apply only to a DC motor, but in general to any kind of inductive floats. The connection that you see here is fine, but it allows you to control the voltage and motor and the current only in one quadrant. So this can work only as a motor. So it cannot work as a generator if you want to reverse the direction, if you want to go backwards, for example. You cannot use this connection, and you will need to use a more complicated connection, which we will discuss next week. Questions? <laughs>